Okay, so can you guys explain, before we move to a, a target just acquired, um, can you explain like your overall strategy, Google is buying a company every week? I mean, I've seen all those posts about it's crazy, right, the pace at which you're acquiring. And uh, Fritz, you've, you've been involved in a number of deals also with Microsoft and also possible deals. Maybe we, we start with uh, Anil, you want to explain what's Google's strategy and how, how can people here get acquired by you? Sure. Um, yeah, we, we've, it's been a crazy year. Uh, started sort of coming out of the, um, the slowdown late last year um, into this year. We, it, you know, I think it was going to be around 40 deals this year, probably. So it's been a bit crazy. Clearly, acquisitions is not our strategy. Our strategy is set, and we look at how acquisitions can help our strategy. Um, but you know, I think coming out of a slowdown, we've decided that. Uh, acquisitions can help speed up certain elements of our strategy. So that's, that's been a focus for us. Can you, um, can you talk about the recent uh, public acquisitions, the ones you've just uh, done, uh, both in Europe and US? Yeah, so um, uh, most recently, our uh, most recent deal is actually European. It's a UK Cambridge company, uh, which um, was in the uh, s sort of speech recognition space. So. Um, Phonetic Arts is the name of the company. So a, you know, a group of like really skilled, deep te technologists and engineers in, in speech recognition, speech understanding space uh, with some great IP and some great talent that we hope to deploy and make uh, solutions better and um, better for users. So you know, that's a great, a great deal and a very typical deal that Google does with a strong element and component of engineering and IP. Fritz, uh, how are you doing? I'm well, thanks. So, you, you're involved. You're one of the leaders of Cop CopDev at Microsoft. What, what's, what's your strategy? What's, um, can, can you give us an update on how micro Microsoft? You know, what, what's your latest acquisition and sure. what are you looking for? Well, we've we've actually not done as many acquisitions in the past few years. Um, and I think if you look from sort of the 2005 to 2008. We did a lot of, we do two types of deals traditionally. We do smaller deals that are uh, specifically designed to advance the ambitions of a specific product, where we'll do a product acquisition or, or a team acquisition or, or a tech IP acquisition. And then the other type of deal that we do is sort of large, uh, the confluence of strategy and acquisitions where we do industry structure shifting, transformational type large deals. Um, and those obviously take sometimes years to consummate um, and uh, you know, lots of, of dancing between the companies. Yahoo was a good example of that, where we explored. You know, you did this deal for Microsoft. Uh, I, I mean, I was one of uh, many people who did it. Um, you know, my boss, and I think Steve uh, spent a lot of time on that as well, and, and the CFO Chris Liddell um, at the time. Um, Can you remind us time. what, like most of the room will know, but why, why did you do that? Um, so that deals again. That's that's a good example of a, of a sort of a, the confluence of strategy and, uh, and and sort of an acquisition to advance it. Um, there we decided that we wanted to get in the search game, and part of that, um, you know, our online advertising ambition um, was getting to scale. You, to play in that game, you have to get to scale. Um, without scale, you can't get a critical mass of advertisers into your system because um, you just don't have the inventory to attract them. And, um, and so you'll, you'll have inferior economics versus a player with lots of scale. Also, you have less data to train your search algorithm and so forth. So we saw Yahoo you know, a long time ago when we decided to get into search as a very strategic partner. Yep. And taking the industry from sort of three players to two, you know, it made sense for the second and third player to work together because um, we would both benefit from that. So that was sort of the logic behind that deal. So that, that's one, one of them. And the other one is you try to acquire Facebook, right? Um, we had several long conversations with Facebook over a period of time. The, the deal that, that we ended up doing was... No, but you tried to acquire it. I, we, I, we would have loved to acquire Facebook, but Facebook was never for sale. Um, no, and but you tried to acquire it. Yeah, we, ah. I could say we tried to acquire it's Facebook. <laughs> so, I mean... Anybody, you know, at the time we ended up doing the, the investment of $240 million, um, I believe it was, for a small stake, at, I think it was a $15 billion valuation, which, you know, we took a lot of criticism at the time for that. Um, I forget the number of users that they had, but it was probably, you know, as an order of magnitude, definitely smaller than what it is today, obviously, it's sub 100 million users. 
2007. Um, and the, we, again, that was an example like Yahoo where we ended up not doing a full acquisition, but a deep strategic relationship. Um, and in that case, with an investment. Can so. you tell us, like, and I appreciate you answering the questions and just forgetting a little bit about the, you know, the, the Microsoft corporate. Like, I'm talking to Fritz right now. So, so how is it? Like, you call Zook and you said hi. Um, we'd like to acquire Facebook. I mean, you have no. You know, most of the since that was such a large deal, um, you know, most of the big companies there's ongoing conversations about strategic opportunities, ways to work together, business development relationships. Um, and uh, Facebook just was kind of growing, and they had a lot of similar characteristics to Microsoft in the old days. A very young, very ambitious and visionary founder, strong engineering culture with a platform vision. And ultimately, we said, hey, look, we are sort of the best platform in the world and the client computing side of things. They're emerging as an interesting platform from the cloud. We should be doing something together. What, what um, made the deal not go through? Was it um, that Mark Zuckerberg didn't want to sell? like ever, or was it that it was too expensive for you? What, what, was there a number that he, would, he was ready to sell? To yeah, I, I can't talk about the specifics of, of that deal. And, and to be honest, you'd have to you know, talk to Mark and Steve, and you, you know, the, the right, senior leadership are the, the ones deal, who ended right? up doing the deal. You, you've led that deal, right? No, I was just one of, uh, one of the members of the deal team. Yeah. So I do all the work, and they get all the glamorous oh, part of the, uh, you know, actually uh, doing the negotiation and, and the handshake. So, um, but yeah, certainly there's a number an offer for 15, you said. 15 billion. That's what we end up doing the investment at. So. Oh, you invested at 15 billion. So, yeah. so I take it you would have acquired it for 15 billion. No, I, I, I can't comment on the numbers that we're willing to do, obviously. Um, but you know, you, you can say that the, the investment was strategic. At coming in with preferred stock, it was safe to do it at a high valuation because um, we would, you know, been the last money out, and we also achieved some strategic objectives, pulling them in as a partner. Now you've seen what we've been able to do on Bing and integrating the Facebook yep. data. Um, so, you, you know, again, it's, we don't take a, a sort of an acquisitions only point of view to our corp dev conversations. It's like, there's a lot of strategic alignment between us. Let's figure out a way to work together. That can be a business development relationship, partnership, an investment, if that's going to help the, our partner and, achieve their goals and, or an acquisition. And this has ended up being an amazing deal for you because investing in Facebook at 15 billion, it may, might look crazy, but now it's 60 or something, right? Yeah, I don't, I mean, uh, the secondary markets, you know, there's a lot of volatility, but um, certainly I would have liked to have gotten some carry on that investment. Right, did you put um, some money <laughs> yourself? <laughs> no, we, uh, we weren't allowed to do that, but, um, but it was a good investment for the company. How, sure. how, how far do you think it will go? You think Facebook is going to, you know, become the market, what's the Microsoft market cap? Um, I don't, we trade in a range, you know, 200 to 250 200? billion. Think, I think today think it's probably Facebook 230. think Facebook will reach that? That's a good question. I think um, they have a lot of option value remaining and they definitely could get there. They're one of the very few companies on the planet that, that could get there. But to say definitively that they will, um, I don't know. I, you know I, don't, I think that that would require maybe a little bit of a pivot um, in some of their business model. Um, I think capturing direct response advertising and mobile, location yep. informed, there's a great business there. Um, they've, you know, their CPCs you know, have reportedly done quite well um, on their sort of PC ad business, but um, I think as you get into the mobile space where you're seeing Google with places and Facebook with their location uh, uh, play and Bing and stuff, we're all going after that space because it's such, there's such amazing economics there, yeah. which is obviously why you know, Yelp is an interesting asset, you know, um, reportedly, uh, and uh, you know, maybe Groupon might have been an interesting asset to, to Google. Yeah. Um, trying to pivot the questioning over to Anil here. <laughs> yeah, um, Anil, well, how is I've, your, I've never heard of Groupon, how is who are they? How is your group on acquisition going? Who are, I've heard of Von Privé. <laughs> the copycat of Von Privé. Th them I've heard of, yeah. Group on, no, I don't, don't know them. We'll, we'll, go back, we'll go back to Anil in a second. Pierre, um, so you founded, uh, we, 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 I have lots of, lots of questions for you. Um, Pierre, you uh, created Price Minister in what, what was it, 2000? 2000. 2000, when at the heart of a bubble. What? Right after August 2000, so yeah. And Price Minister, for those of you, is there anyone that doesn't know Price Minister? Yeah, I, I guess, let's, let's play safe. We have a lot, we have thousands of people watching online as well. So, one of the leading e-commerce sites in Europe, what, what's the size? Uh, we're leading in France, in audience, France. Um, and we're growing fast in Spain and very small in the UK. Okay. So, we're, we're mainly French today. Okay, and so you, you've just been acquired? Yeah, we sold to Rakuten, 100% uh, of the shares for about 200 million euros, actually a bit over that. 
Um, 200 million euros. Yep. Rakuten being a Japanese company. Rakuten, yeah, Rakuten is, uh, is, was said at some point, but some companies were said that, but I think for them it's really true. It was said to be the biggest companies you never heard of, and that's really true. They're, they're doing, uh, the valuation um, is uh, 10 billion dollars. Um, they're, they're, they're public in Tokyo, and they own over 30% of the Japanese e-commerce. Um, which is really huge because um, some people say Amazon is dominant in the US, but they have, I think, 8% of the US e-commerce. So Rakuten is really dominant in, in Japan. And they, um, they, so they, they buy everything e-commerce that, that succeeds, right? Um, no, no, they actually have a very clear vision of what, what they want to do. Um, they buy marketplaces. Um, they don't like uh, stocks and logistics. I mean, not, they have some in Japan, but they don't like it so much. Uh, and they want to build an ecosystem. So in Japan, they have the biggest online bank, the biggest uh, online credit card, the biggest online travel site, um, biggest online golf site, which is big in Japan. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so they really have a, and they have a huge point program that helps them, you know, really use their customer base in each of their businesses, which, I which is very hard to do, and they, they achieve that. So that's what they want to do in the world, buy marketplace, and, and then launch the other, the other businesses. Before I keep going, we'll, we'll, we'll take some questions. So get ready on, on the theme of how to get acquired, please. Um, so I don't know if, um, if, if we can get the mic ready. Uh, Sabine, if you listen to me, if we can get the mic ready for questions in a few minutes. And if you can, uh, I guess the best is to line up here in the middle. Um, so that we see you, and I can give you my, my microphone myself. So if I can add something, yes, um, I think that actually uh, talking about Groupon and Facebook um, is not much helping for companies that figure that are figuring out how they can get acquired, because I think that when you're Groupon doing two billion dollars of revenues after two years, or when you're Facebook being bigger than Google in revenues, I mean not in revenues in traffic. You, I mean, you know that it's not going to be that hard to get acquired at some point. I mean, the only risk you have is you get too big and you don't get acquired and you have to get public if you want some liquidity, but it's not such a big issue. I think the very big issue is when you're growing fast, but you're not big enough so that you are sure, you know, that, that basically you are safe. And so you have a business that is, you know, maybe two, three, four years old, growing fast, um, but um, you, you have a trade-off, so you can you can uh, either continue directly, uh, I mean, on your own and independently, and maybe increase your risk over time, but increase your, your, your you know, the, grass, the, the, the size of your company and, 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 and uh, realize better your vision, or you can uh, sell and, and have two things that are interesting. One is money. more means to develop your company, and one is money. How much, do you, so how much do you make for yourself? I, have to, I had 20%, so I, I made 40 million. 40 million euros? Yeah. Cool, congratulations. Thank you. So how do you feel? <laughs> oh, I, I feel the uh, same. Uh, safe? Same, same. Oh, but you feel the same? Did Actually, I, I, I... What I, did you do? You, you went crazy a little bit? A Porsche, a Ferrari? I'm, I'm now, I, I, I feel no, really boring. I'm trying boring. to break We're in France, right? No, but I, I feel... You can't talk about this in France. Oh, no, 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 I, I'm very happy to talk. I have no problem talking about that. The thing is, when I'm asked that, I feel very, like a very boring person because Actually, I had, I mean, before that, I already went to nice restaurants and did some parties and went to nice, for, to doing some travels, some nice travels, so I didn't change much. Didn't change I much. want to buy a place in Paris, but the real estate market is crazy, so I still rent my small apartment. Um, <laughs> and I have two children, so I don't buy a Porsche because they would get sick with the air, you know? So, oh, so okay. it's, it's terribly boring. But, yeah, uh, but, but tell me, so why did you sell? I mean, we're like, we're Europe, we need to lead, you had a great, you, have, you still have a great company. Like, we, we needed you to not sell. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, Plus, you sell to Japanese. Is what you should have become a French, <laughs> I mean, stay the French hero. I, 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 I almost thought you were getting racist. But I'm joking because I heard some French journalists saying, why did you sell to strangers, to foreigners, and to Japanese? Yeah. And, and that's very strange. I love Japan. You myself. don't like Japan? <laughs> I love Japan. <laughs> I know. No, I mean, actually, actually I... I, I choose to sell to Japanese instead of selling to Americans. And you that chose. was a choice. Yeah, that was a choice. Oh, you don't like Americans. Um, and uh, I like American too, but actually I think that, I think it's much more fun to sell to uh, Japanese. Um, I think- Oh, you choose by fun? I mean, I, I, I committed to stay five years. So it's important to, you know, to like, the, to like yeah. your, your acquirer. And actually- You know you can leave earlier, right? You just don't get as much money. I can, yeah, I can if I want. But 
I think that the Japanese culture is a lot of uh, trust and, and letting their subsidiaries, you know, go on their own and leaving a lot of autonomy. In most cases of American companies buying companies, they, they switch the founder after two months. Ah, we'll talk to Anil in a and, second. And I, I mean, not in every... Oh, no, I mean Anil and Fritz, that's what I Someone meant. Someone agrees there. <laughs> and Someone uh, uploaded. Yes, again, if you have questions, uh, just please... Um, line up here and we'll, we'll, we'll take one. So, so just to answer to your question, so wh why did I sell? I think that uh, I don't need more than 40 million. I think that any extra money, I will not know how to spend it. Yeah. So for the money, no need to stay. And for the adventure, I think it's more fun to have uh, more ways of acquiring new companies in Europe and develop uh, basically, you know, with, with more, yeah, more money to develop the company. You invest now in startups? Yeah. Oh, like, okay. Oh how, yeah. how many investments? So another, I mean, Europe is changing, really. So, so how many invest investments? I have about 15 investments. Wow. Uh, and uh, Follow I... Follow that guy when, when you see <laughs> So I just invested in SmartDate, uh, smartdate.com, which is a dating site, doing very well. And also I've, I co-founded an um, entrepreneur's um, fund in France called uh, ISAI. And we raised 35 million from 70 entrepreneurs. Wow. Which is actually one of the other reasons why I sold uh, is that I really love investing. And before I had to borrow money from my bank to invest. And they, at some point, they said to me, you know, we cannot lend you money for you to invest in startups. It's, it's not a good way. So cool. um, that's a, that was actually one of the motivations. Cool. Do we have any questions for Anil, for Fritz, or for, uh, yes, over there? You were supposed to, well, that's okay. So can we send the mic here? Me, you mean me? Yes. Um, what I would like to know is, from an entrepreneur's perspective, how important is it actually to actually focus on selling, especially in early stages? Like if, if, if a VC is asking me this question, like who is going to be your exit? Uh, this, is a, this is a VC for me who is not interesting in this very moment. Is it? Did you get? I, the, I, I didn't, didn't get, get it. I, I, I get it. I think I understood your question. Are you saying, how important is it as a startup to focus on what your exit is versus building your business? Is that what you're asking? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I you mean, can answer it. Very good <laughs> English. <laughs> now you answer it. Okay. I thought I could just rephrase the question and pass <laughs> it on. <laughs> no, but you deal with <laughs> No, you I deal with it's a great question. It's a yeah, great it's question. A great question. I mean, you deal with it as an acquirer. Yeah. So. I mean, uh, listen, I mean, I think ultimately, if you don't build your business, achieving certain milestones, it doesn't matter how many doors you knock on and how much you talk about acquisitions, it isn't going to work. I mean, I think you have to be tactical about things, however, and I think you have to build the relationships through partnerships or alliances with eventual buyers. Uh, that just you know, enables a smooth transition it were you to sell at some point in time. But I think ultimately you need to focus 110% on building your business with the right ingredients, not making silly mistakes that can upset an acquisition. There are, I mean, there are so many deals that I look at that just have so many hairs on that uh, you know you you think that they've never received any advice. I mean, putting commercial deals in place where you're giving away your IP, things like that. Just just be careful when you do stuff in your normal course of business so that it doesn't upset the boat. Were you to decide to sell? But, and develop the relationships you need to develop in order to you know, position yourself well, but focus on building your business. I'd say actually it's the role of the investor to help you doing that. And as an entrepreneur, you should focus on your vision. But right, that's you what fail if you focus on like, I'm building this to sell it. It's horrible, Yeah, definitely. Right? You, but have you ever thought of that ob before? Ob obviously not. But, but the thing is, if you, have, you need to have investors that you know, think about that instead of you. Because if they don't, if you don't have them, you may ma make mistakes like selling IP or whatever. Because, and I, I think actually that's why uh, there are good VCs and bad VCs. I think good investors leave you focus on vision and help you, well, think, instead of you, think about uh, exit. Let me counter that because um, I think also, you know, the issue of an investor is a, is a capital raising question as well. And, and I think, you know, it's dangerous to raise too much capital if you're, it's clear that you're, what you are is a technology tuck-in acquisition versus a big standalone IPO. So I think when you're choosing investors, you also need to think about what kind of company am I going to be when I grow up? What is my likely exit? And therefore, what is my appropriate capital structure? But there are many companies who are bought to be sold to Google, right? 
No, but who are well, creative. They're cre I don't, right. I don't, I mean, listen, uh, you know, created to sell is a difficult thing to do. No, but we have Dave McClure coming, like, later on, and who's very entertaining, as yeah, always. No, so, so and he says everywhere, if I quote it, quote him properly, actually, we'll, we'll hear him, but he says, fuck that, generally, he says, fuck every two words, and he says, you know, it's great, I invest just a little bit, and the goal of a company is to build something cool, small, that won't change the world, I, that, that's not the objective, but it's gonna sell to 20, No, I think what he's doing, uh, I think what he's doing is saying, he's, re he, I mean, he'll be up here and he'll talk for himself, yeah. I'm sure, but I believe he's, he's recognizing that there are many gaps to be plugged, by these companies, and he's saying, let's build them in a way that doesn't uh, doesn't pre prevent an exit at the earlier stage, right. with the right capital structure, with the right ingredients in terms of team and tech, right. and then let's sell. Turns out it's hard to build a huge company, so most startups will actually make it to that product stage, maybe. And but that's okay, we'll right? Be able to build we should, a business. We should take the just, just to add yeah. one one last thing. Definitely don't focus, well, it's good to build the relationship. I would you know, try to get one person at potential acquirers that you know and can have dialogue with, but don't focus on your exit. Um, the market, I think, is more efficient than people would give it credit for. You know, We typically know what the up and coming companies are. We've got lists of these things. We're monitoring their evaluations and what they're up to. Um, we know who they're interested. They know who we're interested. So you can trust the efficiency of the market, I think, to a large degree. Why, to why don't you? Ready acquire more? Are you not like looking at Google and like, oh, they acquire a lot? Of well, that is sort of what we were doing from 05 to 08. I think there's a natural ebb and flow between strategy and deals. We're, we've sort of um, been working on major product cycles. So like Windows 7, right, for example. Like the phone. Yeah. yeah, and the phone and stuff. So um, we, there hasn't been a natural timing wise uh, place to start doing those. But I think, hey, we're always looking. Part of the issue we've had is also valuation, right? Yeah. So. Um, you know, Google's been particularly aggressive and prices out of some deals, and right. um, so. Next question. There is one here, and then one one here, please. Yes. No, just talk. Just talk. We're gonna put. You, no, the mics are fine. Just talk. Just keep talking. I'll talk loud. Oh, here we go. Good. First of all, congratulations on your Rakuten uh, sellout. That's good. Question for that is. Um, why sell out to the Japanese? I love Japanese. I've lived there for 10 years, worked with them for over 20. But you would have got a higher valuation from an American company. So I'm curious as to why you chose Rakuten as opposed to a potential American buyer. And second question, more important one is, for a startup, focusing on an American acquirer, so to speak, is it more beneficial to go after American market, in other words, users, or in markets uh, out of the USA, which would be potentially interesting for them strategically. Okay, um, second part, I, I would, for, first of all, thank you. Second part, I would never uh, go in a market thinking about, you know, being acquired. Uh, again, I think that th the thing is, I agree the market is quite efficient, so, so if you have a great company, it will get acquired someday, but you never know the day and you never know what company because they have uh, always have hidden agendas. I mean, not hidden in terms of mysterious, hidden because you just don't know them, right? So you don't know what the strategic focus of the companies are. So I've, I've actually had plenty of talks with plenty of American companies, European companies, French companies. Um, but the thing is, it, it's ne it never matched. So um, w sometimes we didn't want to sell at that time to that company, to that, m to that uh, amount. And sometimes it's the companies that were so we talked with a very big company at some point, and then they bought uh, another company for $1 billion, and that was five years ago, so we're much smaller than that, much, much smaller. So they just you know, didn't spend time with us because we were so small. So if we had um, built a strategy to be acquired by them, you know, we would have committed suicide, right? You know? So you, you just don't want to do that. You want to focus on your company, and, and I think that's very important. Um, then in terms of, of, um, of amount of money, uh, valuation. I think it's it's valuation is very complicated uh, because it's partly it's uh, depends of what you what you're worth. Um, in our case, it's really a multiple of multiple of EBIT, so that makes sense. But for companies to acquire you, they either so they need they really acquire you if you're strategic for them, and then if you are strategic, if you're not, they will not. They will not. If you are strategic, they will make the evaluation, I think, between two things. One being um, multiple of EBIT, basic thing, or the other being competition. 
So what you want is you want to have both. You want to have good EBIT and good competition. Uh, and it's what we had. So that's, what, that's why we made a good sale. So we were strategic for several companies. Uh, and actually, just to answer your point about American companies, I think we were more strategic for Japanese because they had no presence in Europe. So we were their gateway to Europe. Whereas all, m most of our American acquirers already had Ameri um, European companies. Uh, you only talk about America, or did no one French wanted to buy you to oh, keep you French? There are no acquirers in the internet in France. There are no acquirers? Uh, they, don't, they don't believe in it. I mean, uh, kind uh, can of. Can you a, believe that? It's, that it's, just a, said that? it's a kind of joke said like that, but it's kind of true. I mean, we, we, we've talked to f some French acquirers, um, and uh, are not, I mean, few of them are serious, but very few. Uh, most of them pretend they're interested in the internet, but yeah. they're not really interested. So they're interested in buying companies for like almost free. But, but companies that are almost free are not good companies. Um, and most of the... I uh, think we'll invite them next year. We should invite like... Well, they uh, not they only tell French, you they're going to make... Industrial, you yeah. know, like leaders of media in Europe who buy nothing, don't understand the internet, and that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, they want either not come or send someone very friendly who will say, yeah, we want to buy many companies next year. Fritz? Yeah, so for most technology companies with deep technology, re uh, geography isn't that much of a constraint, um, you know, which is one of the brilliant parts of the sort of technology business model is that it's sort of globally scalable. Um, and that's why a lot of the big tech companies have dev resources all over the world and so forth. We can make that work. So in the, the cases where there is regional sensitivity to an acquisition, it's, it's usually because um, you need to shore up a position there or there's regional scale dynamics or there's strong network effects in a particular business and you want to consolidate in a particular region. Um, so, but in most of the cases of where there's deep technology plays, um, you can be sort of geography independent um, in determining who your acquirers can be. We'll take uh, one more, the last question. Hit my question on the head. Oh, really? You sure? Yeah, it's exactly okay. what I was going to ask. Is there another Yes, here, right there. Oh, sorry. Oh, you were waiting already for a while? Okay, well, well, we'll try to do both of them real quick. Otherwise, you'll be upset. I don't want you to be upset. And then we have uh, the, the, um, the winners. The winners. Yeah. Okay, really quickly. Um, how much do you think uh, is the valuation of the technological part of the company at the moment, and especially in the situation where most of the technology is going in the cloud and many people are using APIs? So the amount of steel that's in the company and the amount of developers that's in the company, how that uh, influences the evaluation? So, so what, what are the criteria that influencing valuations? Yes, in the technology part. Okay, we'll take the next one, so I'll, I'll remember both and we we'll answer them both and then we will stop here. Just keep talking. Yeah, go ahead. We, we'll like, Shall we'll I just shout? Oh. Here you go. It's just that they need some time to sure. find you. Okay, hi, um, my name's Neil from NASA.com. Um, I was interested to hear Pierre say uh, that you're tied in. Keep Sorry, can you hear me right now? Yes. I'll do the plug again, NASA.com. Don't, don't move your hand. <laughs> Pierre, I was interested to hear that you're tied in, uh, as is normal with an acquisition, uh, but I was particularly interested to put the question to the two ge other gentlemen about the importance of, uh, of the people when you acquire a business as opposed to the product. Okay, so valuation and people, great topics to finish this panel. I need you want to start. I see you're like uh, yeah, you're ready. I mean, uh, I th for, for us, uh, in uh, in the smaller acquisitions that are focused on um, tech tuckins, as we call them, or you know, scrappy innovation deals, the people are everything, right? And, and you you even got tied in for five years. And it's absolutely critical. You don't know the industry is moving so quickly. You don't know from one year to another what part they'll be working on. So, so assessing the the quality of the people and the engineering team is, is, is absolutely crucial in every deal we do, regardless of how big it is. Uh, in terms of valuation, um, you know, in, in reality, a lot of the um, deals that we do, uh, we will probably re-implement uh, a lot of the uh, architecture stack on, on our own systems. So I think what, what we would look at is, how have you uh, thought about scale? How have you thought about uh, you know, some solving some deep, challenging computer science problems, and, and those are the two things we would value more than perhaps which APIs you're using or which LAMP stack you're using or, or, or that kind of thing. So we value that less, but it's the, the deep thinking around the problem domain that you, you've, you've solved that we, that we value.
Preet? Yeah, similar answer. I mean, the people are everything in a deal. Um, you know, technology will atrophy if the people building it sort of leave, and so it's constantly being needing to be sort of evolved. Um, and so, so it's critical. Also, when you're in as many businesses as Microsoft, um, it's hard for us to have the domain expertise that, that an entrepreneur can get. And so, you know, buying someone who knows that particular sector better than anyone in the world is a, a large part of the allure uh, to us. But um, in terms of the valuation side, um, it varies depending on the business. I mean, sometimes it's all about the, it, it's, since the valuation is based on the sustainability of the business and how much future cash flow that business can generate, um, or you know, cash flow can generate in some of our existing businesses. Um, it just varies deal to deal. How much is people based versus how much is scale and traction based versus how much is uh, you know actual profits that they have that we want access to. Um, so it's hard to say, but um, you know, valuations ultimately just about sustainable differentiation and and how uh, how much you know profit opportunity you have down the road. It's been phenomenal to have you uh, with, with us. Um, Anil, do you have, do you have any closing remarks? Because Pierre will stay with, uh, with the judges, so uh. any closing remarks? Fritz as well, real quick. We were really happy, by the way, that you came all the way, Fritz from yeah, Seattle. I mean, I, th I think that the biggest York. closing remark I would say is, you know, and I think it goes back to, should, you know, should, how do you structure your company for sale or build building? I think what, what you need to do as entrepreneurs is think about the big vision, and I think, um, and your investors will want this too, I'm sure, but what, 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 what attracts us most is solving big problems and, and solving them smartly. And so whether or not you've got half the way there, quarter the way there, we believe that if we can transfer you into our, into our network, in our, on our platform, you'll be able to achieve your vision quicker, sooner, and faster. And uh, so we have Xavier who is, uh, said he's, Xavier Niel is investing in a company every three days. <laughs> Again, I mean, and uh, you're buying one every week. So you could get funded today and get acquired next week by an ill. How do we contact you guys? Like, you always think like Google is this huge thing and Microsoft. Can, how, how does it, like, is it you looking at companies or can, can, can they email you? Anil yeah, at yeah, Google? it's anil at google.com. Anil at google.com. Um, yeah. So I if you to want to sell your company, you just send a mail to anil at google.com. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the three key ways are my own network, the VCs and the angels and uh, a critical filtering tools um, and obviously we have a great team of engineers who spot and work with and partner with companies so, so internally as well. So partnering with Google is also a good way to catch your attention but they can email you right? Sure. Cool and Fritz? Yeah I mean the best way to uh, well closing remark quickly the three assets that you have you can of course sort of sequentialize it are hiring a great team even if you don't build a great product in the end, or it's not what you thought it was, you can still sell a company if you have an incredible engineering team, world-class engineering team, because there's always gonna be a, su a supply constraint for that. Then secondly, in terms of once you've got the team, focus on building some really unique and differentiated IP and a great product, and then the last is profits. So we look for those three assets. Um, so that might be a framework for how you can think about you know, building your business if, uh, and potentially being acquired. And then in terms of navigating um, Microsoft, I mean, with over 100,000 employees, it's it's challenging, it's hard for me even. But um, there, are, there are many around here. Yeah, and so I was gonna say actually, the, the, the number one best way is to um, reach out and build a relationship with the local subsidiary and to get a sort of a sponsor, someone who's really excited about you. Um, we get pinged with so many deals from VCs, bankers, and just entrepreneurs um, who track down our email addresses that it's, it's literally overwhelming. It's like the email problems that we've been talking about here. And so, um, find an advocate, and that's the best way to sort of get some serious attention. Fritz, I think you need to use Gmail. It has priority inbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Pierre, you stay with us. Uh, Fritz, uh, and I hope you come back next year. And uh, I was really happy you had a good time, Fritz. Absolutely.